what it is, but if anybody would like to, I'd like to do a demonstration on someone. Uh, just a real quickie. So if I'm anybody's sorry. not shy, okay, you'd like to do it? Okay, great. And so what I'll just do is I'll put all your, we'll, I'll, I'll call you up when we're ready, but I'll put all your information so we're ready to rock and roll. Just say, yeah, I'm going to move this. No, actually, you're you guys all hear me pretty good. I have a pretty good projection voice, but do you guys want to sit over here? Yeah. To be part of the crowd, be even better, because then I don't have to shout as much. Is this your normal tone right now? Where you yeah, this is my normal oh, tone. Like it. Are you yeah. I have a pretty, aer I used to teach aerobics, so I have a very good projectile voice. It's, you know, when you have uh, mm -hmm. 10 brothers Just and sisters, second. the one who talks the loudest gets the most attention, yeah. so. I'm the 10th child, so I don't really a lot of time. I have to do this, but I'm going to move you back. You're like, you're all right. Does it just syncing up on me? Just go with your head and... Just write down your name, birthday, and that's all I need, really. Name and birthday, you said. That's it. Name and birthday, and then I'll be good to go. First and last. We're rolling. Okay. So first of all, welcome to our uh, Monday chat sessions where you guys can ask questions and learn information about some of the things we do. Uh, my name is Liliana Partida. I am the nutritionist here, and I also wear many hats. And one of them is uh, uh, I do a lot of emotional work here. And one of the machines that I use is called Evox. Now, Evox is a really wonderful tool to just give me and the patient an idea of what emotional toxins are in the tissue. Now, you guys have might, may have heard this term that you may not have heard this term, which is called somantic patterning. Does everybody know what that means? Somantic patterning? Uh, okay, yeah, so, so for example, let me give you a good example. If I were walking, um, let's just say with a friend and I was chit-chatting away um, out in some little country area, you know, little area and if I came across I was chit chatting and if I came across a snake out of the corner of my eye my whole body would pull back all right because it would go into shock go, oh my god a snake I almost stepped on a snake now because of that experience your body registered it now it's in the tissue unbeknownst to me if I would be walking on the same street in, you know in a mountain road and I'm talking with my friend out of the corner of my eye there was a stick in the road, my body would pull back just as if it was a snake because it looked like a snake. Mm -hmm. So for my brain, before my brain could even uh, register, that oh, it's just a stick in the road, it's already reacted. And that's called somantic patterning. So oftentimes we even ask ourselves, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe, right? It just automatically happens and that's a somantic pattern. Now what's really interesting, as, as easy as for us to be able to have 50% mother DNA, 50% father DNA, we can also have 50% of their somantic patterning, just as much as we can download toxins in vitro, we can actually have a replication of somantic toxin disturbances as well. Like let's just say, for example, if your mother was a hypochondriac, um, especially when it came to uh, claustrophobia, you may have never had a personal experience. Maybe she had an experience getting stuck in the elevator, okay? So she would, um, every time you get close to her, no, no, I'm gonna take the stairs because I don't know the elevator. So all of a sudden now you become fearful of the elevator, never having your own experience. And so again, we can actually give those to our children and it can go from generation to generation. And so what the Evox does, it helps us to um, recognize what those emotional toxins are and then we use a biofeedback to disrupt them. So if you go to acupuncture and the, the, the acupuncture says, oh, you've got too much heat in your kidneys or you don't have enough chi in your liver, they're just doing it by a pulse reading. But what we're doing it is we are detecting it based upon the inflections of your voice. Your body doesn't lie. Any way you look at it, your body doesn't lie. And this is why it's so important for you guys all to pay very close attention to your intuition. The gut feeling is really 
the second brain. And if I really understood that, then I would start really paying attention to how my body responds. If I get asked to do something and I lean in this direction like, sure, then that means all of my cells, all of the intelligence of my cells are saying yes to this. But if you ask me something and I slightly pull back and I kind of make a hesitation, it's because something inside of me and say, this is not to your highest interest. And then I might engage in it and then I might say, why did I do that? I knew I shouldn't have done that, blah, blah, blah. Well, I didn't listen to my intuition. And oftentimes we operate out of, I have to, I should, I feel guilty, they expect. That is not a good way to operate for your immune system because you're operating from a level of guilt and guilt has no place in your home when it comes to healing. And so just remember every emotion that you experience has a place in regards to tell you where you're at and what you need to do next. So again, if we look at emotions simply as a measuring to what direction we need to go to, we would save ourselves from having arguments in life because we would take responsibility and I have a, I have a anger that's welling up inside me. And anger is just an emotion that should tell you one thing. Now, when I ask patients, what is the color of anger? 99.9, .9, they say red, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when you think of things of red, what is red? The red are like a stop sign, right? It's, uh, you know, with toxic hazardous material, right? Your needle's going red. So in essence, fear, <coughs> anger should just tell you one thing. Stop, don't speak another word, don't move another inch because you have lost your emotional intelligence. So now, if you were a person who really understood that, you'd say, wow, if I'm activated in a level of anger, I just lost my emotional intelligence. So anything that comes out of my mouth, any direction that I move is not gonna be from stability. So how beautiful would that be to just recognize that right off the bat? Right. Now at the same time, when you're activated, you can't say to yourself, oh Pollyanna, okay, I'm angry, let's Pollyanna this. No, because you've got your cortisol <coughs> raging and you're fuming. So what you have to say is, okay, I've lost my emotional intelligence. The smartest thing to do is bow out of this situation. Because I could, I could overpower you, I could overscreen you, I could do all these things, but nobody wins. Both people aren't gonna feel good and you're gonna have a toxic residue emotionally that's inside you. You don't know how that other person feels. All we care is what's in your own chemistry. So if I would say to, to the person that I might be want, you know, that activated me, I might say to them, you know what? Obviously, we're not gonna get anything resolved right now, so let's talk about this tomorrow. Now, why did I not say let's talk about this in an hour or after dinner? because those hormones still stay activated until you have repair mode, which is gonna be somewhere around 10 o'clock at night. So if I try to talk about this an hour later, it's still, I might be calm on the outside, but inside I still got the chemistry like some wild horses wanting to go someplace with no place to go. So 24 hours later, what I can do is I can ask myself and I can repeat what happened to me in my mind and say, oh yes, when I think about it right now, that guy was a jerk and they really made me mad. But today, I don't feel like striking like I did yesterday. And I don't even feel like saying what I did yesterday. But then I wanna ask myself, well, anger is a reaction. But what do you feel right now? Okay, and this is beautiful because if I ask myself what I feel, I'm assuming responsibility for my next move. And I'm not gonna say she made me do it, you did this to me, so therefore I did that. I'm gonna say, okay, well, I don't feel so much like striking or doing anything like that, but what I'm feeling, and I go to a feeling and not a reaction, because anger is a reaction. And that feeling might be one emotion only, but we gotta deduce it down to one. It might be fear, it might be abandonment, it might be a sense of not enough, Right, we all have limiting beliefs that run our entire life until we die. Okay, now Evox is not gonna pluck that emotion out of you and all of a sudden now you're gonna be like this clean slate. It, what it's gonna do, it's gonna say, ah, here it is. Once I'm aware of something, I deactivate it by recognizing that it exists. It no longer rules me, but I will still become activated, but how do I wanna handle it knowing that if I move into anger, it's gonna affect my liver, which is gonna affect my immune system. So when I say to myself, okay, here we have an issue of anger, and, it, and the Evox is picking it up, but I don't feel angry. Well, what happens? Now, for example, if anger is an emotion that says stop, the next thing it says is something has gotta change, okay? Now, if, I, if I'm perceiving anger, it's a perception that I'm thinking you are threatening me. You're threatening my personal persona, 
maybe you're 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 belittling me, maybe you're you know bullying me, or maybe you're saying something to me that activates in me an emotion that I had when I was a little girl, and you've just pushed on a wound that has not yet been healed. Now, if I had a wound in my hand and I and you grabbed my hand, what would I do? Would I just smile? I'd say, "Ow!" Well, ow is just anger in another form, right? So if I'm aware that I'm getting angry, I'm activated, but I've lost my emotional intelligence, so I really should not try to resolve anything because it won't work. But the next day I ask myself how I feel. And this is where it all happens. Now I want to go back to that person because I want them in my life. They might be my husband, they might be my coworker, they might be my child, they might be my best friend. I want them in my life. So I have to say to myself, this interaction that we had, I felt this, okay? But what I want to do is I want to examine what is it that I felt, and that that one emotion potentially can be the key to the limiting belief that you have about yourself that's running your entire filter of how you see life. So let's just say, for example, if they said something to me that activated my limiting belief about not enough, okay? They said something to me that, you know, oh, you know, you're not smart enough to do that, blah, 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 right? And I might think to myself, well, I have a PhD. You know, I intellectually know I'm smart, but as a child, my parents used to tell me I was a dummy, and you're this, and you're that, and you're never gonna amount to anything. And so what does that child do? They try to intellectualize it and become what their parents say they're, they are the opposite of what their parents say. But deep down inside, their little five-year-old still believes they're dumb. So that's the belief system that they're living their lives through. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna create things that confirm them being dumb. They may get into a marriage and the wife cheats on them. And they say, oh, I should have known. My friends were telling me, oh, that was dumb. They could get in a business opportunity and, and, and do great success, but then lose everything. And now again, an opportunity to feel dumb. So if there's things that keep happening in your life that show up that you say, you know what? This doesn't feel good. I don't like to have this show up all the time, then there's a, there's a limiting belief that's basically running your program. So again, what we wanna say is I can't pluck out my experiences, but what I can do is I can choose to respond to them differently. And therefore, it's a wound that got healed that's just a scar. And I can say, oh, I remember when that happened, that was really terrible and it really hurt. But today when I talk about it, I don't cry, I don't shout, and I say, oh, I don't want that to happen again. So anger is an opportunity for healing. It's a wound in you that has not yet been healed. So instead of shooting the messenger, what I wanna do is take a step back and really say, okay, opportunity for healing as much as this is painful. And what is the limiting belief? What is the story that I was telling myself? What did I perceive? So when I come back the next day, I wanna come back not from my intellect, because when I come back from my intellect, I'm either gonna make you wrong and me right or I'm gonna tell you why I did what I did to pitch my story. And it's my perception. They can argue with the way I think, but nobody can argue with the way you feel. I can't say, oh no, you don't feel that. That would be ludicrous, right? So if, I, if I'm willing to be vulnerable enough to say I need to express what it is that I feel so that they know that it's painful to me, and if you love me, you will be willing to learn the language of my heart Marriages who stay together, it's because they took the time to learn each other's language. You're not, you were born in the same household. You weren't raised with the same values and belief system. You have to learn that, oh, that makes her angry. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should use a different wording so that she could hear me better. So if we're able to be vulnerable to say to them, you know, I'm really sorry about what happened yesterday. And then what you did is you framed it. You, me, yesterday but then what I do is I take a pause and then I redirect that conversation to me and then I say you know I'm really sorry what happened yesterday but you know what was really strange this morning I woke up with such a sense of fear now I guarantee you anybody that cares at all about you will do this They'll slightly move forward, their whole body will gesture forward, they'll either reach towards you, and they'll say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to make you feel X, Y, and Z. So what they did is they assumed responsible for something you didn't give them. But I guarantee if you come back the next day and say, 
you know, I'm really sorry about the argument we got into, but you made me feel so sad. They're gonna say, wait a minute, that's not what I was trying to do. Oh, you're just being too sensitive. What do you got your period or something? Da, 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 da. Right? And then it becomes another hurt. So if I'm willing to be vulnerable enough to share what it is that I feel without saying you made me, but I woke up with this feeling. And if someone reaches forward that you know that they didn't mean it that way, and now you have clarity. So instead of building resentment for what you thought they said, now you have a clarity of really what they were trying to say to you. Now at the same time, you can have somebody that actually was meaning to do something mean to you. Okay, now we have to distinguish between what is to our highest interest. Now for example, if you have a situation where they say, you say, oh, you know, I woke up with such a sense of fear or sadness, and they say, oh, no motion, no, no moving forward, no nothing, then you say, okay, this person doesn't hear me. And potentially, they may use this as a tool against me. And then in the next argument, they know my weakness. And that will happen. You must be observant. Because if this happens to you, you've got to make a choice. Remember, anger is an emotion that something's got to change. So if I can't change my perception, meaning a new story that tells me, no, that's not what they meant, then potentially I might have to change the atmosphere, which means take myself out of the picture or take them out of the picture. And that's called quitting a job, it's called a divorce, or letting go of people in your life that don't meet your highest interest. And it's okay to do that, because what are you doing? You are taking responsibility of meeting your own personal needs. Now somebody today asked me, well how could I do that if it's my mom, <laughs> right? And I said, well, it becomes a little bit tricker, more, a little bit trickery because of the fact that we have respect and we have loyalty, no matter how terrible of a mom, you still want their love. But if it's at the cost of your immune system and it's at the cost of not being healed, then you may have to just kind of put it over to a side because it won't serve your highest purpose. Then what you have to do is you have to change your attitude towards them. And you just have to say to yourself, well, maybe their mother treated them like that. And maybe grandmother treated her and her grandmother treated, so this is all that they know. So I could come from a level of compassion. They're just not capable of unconditionally loving me without a critical comment. That's just all they know how to do. So I can look at it from a point of view now of compassion. But do I have to put my hand on the fire? No, I don't have to do that. I might say, this relationship is not healthy. And right now I'm very vulnerable. And I don't want anything diffusing or siphoning my strength. I need to build equity. I need to build strength so that I can heal. So again, then you become very political. You don't entangle yourself when they try to, to try to engage you in a what we would consider a lower vibrational conversation. And what you just do is you can say, well, you know, I really see your point of view, mom, but you know what, you and I are completely different and I respect your point of view, maybe you just respect mine. And then you change the subject. You know what was really weird when I came over here this morning, I saw this blah, 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 blah. You deflect. And now you've gotten them off on this tangent of their neuro transmit, I mean, uh, what we call the um, neural patterning of, 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 of what we call habit and get them to do thinking something different. And all of a sudden now you're diffusing them without insulting, without, you know, basically disregarding because nobody, everybody hates to be disregarded. They want to know that you heard them. I really hear what you're saying and I understand how you would feel that. If that was happening to me, I'd feel the same way. But I've got a little bit of a different point of view and it's okay if we have our own point of view about this. And then you change the subject, but then again, if it keeps creating pain for you and it's not healing in any way, it's okay, even if it's your own family, to let them go for a while. I tell my patients, you come through your family, but you're not of them. We're of a different source, which is God's source means we're perfect when we enter this world. And then our environment, our epigenetics around us makes us who we are today. But if we say to ourselves, there's some things I don't like about myself, then I have to say, then there's potentially a limiting belief running my life, running my filter, what is it? So I can dismantle it. And this is what the Ewok says. It's very powerful. Now what's really interesting is that when I do Ewoks, I'm also looking at what we call generational patterning. So I can actually see if this is something that you experienced from the time you were in your mommy's belly to 12, or this is a DNA uh, blueprint that you got from generations past. 
And how powerful is that? Is to say, I can untangle myself from the generation's past of a mindset so that my children don't have to pass that on to their generation. Remember, the fruit doesn't fall too far from the tree, right? So I have to ask myself, am I happy? Let me ask you guys one question and then see if you guys can answer this. Where, when, you, when, a, when, a pe when a person has a disorder, whether it is an immunity, whether it is gut issues, whether it's an illness or cancer, what part of the body do you think it originates in? The body or the mind? Raise your hand if you can tell me that. Take a wild guess. I guess the mind. The mind. Exactly right. Saying. So remember, <coughs> cancer and disease does not originate in the chemistry of your body first. It is an inf it's influenced by the wellness of the being, and I am a being of light, and my being is my consciousness. And if I have lived my life in anger, and resentment, and fear, and anxiety, and jealousy, and envy, I have an unwell being that will eventually create an unwell body. So when we treat any disease, I don't care what it is, we've got to start with how you think and how you feel, okay? Because what is the story that I'm telling myself in my head? It's just a story. I can be, I can start crying if I start telling myself a story about an incident that hurt me so bad, but it happened 10 years ago. That means I haven't properly grieved this. I haven't really let go of it. I have not accepted it. And oftentimes I hear stories of people telling me about what their mother did to them 60 years ago. And it doesn't benefit you at all. I was listening to a podcast and it was great because I got this wonderful, I love podcasts because it, I get a pearl of wisdom out of everything, you know, and I can use it the next day. And they said the success of a human being is three things. One, I have to wake up. I have to wake up. Are my eyes wide opening to what's happening in my life? How my life is? How I'm feeling? Am I happy? Am I happy? Am I well? Am I sad? I'm waking up to my consciousness. Then what I have to do is I have to grow up. I have to quit blaming my mother, my father, my teacher, my uncle, my siblings, my ex-husband. I have to just quit blaming because I will never get better. So what I have to do is I have to say to myself, okay, if I grow up, Grown-ups ask questions. They don't sequester. When someone's shouting and screaming at you and if you go, oh, I'm a bad person, you go into child world immediately. There will be no resolution. I'm the bad girl. They're screaming at me. It's my fault, even if it's not. But if I go into a grown-up mode and I say, oh, why would you say that? What makes you think that? How, does that, how do I demonstrate that? I'm asking questions. And that person now is going to have to answer. Well, you know, when someone says something to you not nice, you say, why would you say that? All of a sudden now they're gonna say, why did I say that? And now they've gotta assume responsibility because they've gotta explain why they said that. So again, grown-ups ask questions. They don't sequester in a child mode. So now I've woken up, now I've grown up and I've, I've assumed responsibility of my own happiness, my own joy. No one's gonna steal my sense of peace from me. Then I gotta show up. I gotta show up in life. I can't meditate things out away from me. I can't pray things out of me. It all helps. It all helps. But I have to be active and be willing to do the move, the next move. What is it that I have to do? Well, how do I how do I have to engage in exercise and, and good diet and meditation and getting rid of the anxiety? All of these things are things that we don't necessarily need to pay for. We just need to put time into recognizing and showing up for these things. So I thought that's a really a powerful statement. Wake up, grow up, and show up. So if you think about that in any situation that you get into, you ask yourself, okay, let me do that right now. Let me wake up, let me grow up, let me assume responsibility. What was my role in this? How did I, what part did I play in this? Because you're not just an innocent person, there's two people. How did I activate within them this activation? So how beautiful it is 
to recognize that I have 100% power of my own destiny based upon my emotional field. And happiness and joy and gratitude allows you to be in the presence of loving yourself. Because healing is not outside of you. It's not the pill, it's not your IV, it's not the doctor in the white coat, it's your unwavering faith that you can. It's not hope. Hope is the flashlight that leads you to the door, but faith is the key that opens it up. And if I don't have that faith and convi conviction, then the likelihood of cancer and things like that coming back is 100%. So how powerful is that? Very powerful. So um, questions till right now. Any questions about what I've said right now? Go ahead. I do. So um, you have an argument and anger comes up and you don't strike because mm -hmm. you're not intelligent at that moment. Right. And you wait until the next day. What do you do between the argument at 8 o'clock and the next morning okay. where you're raging on the inside? Wonderful. Okay, so when I have anger, I autumn now this is what's really interesting. Your emotions create your chemistry. So when I have anger, my blood pressure goes up. That means now I have activation of cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. They're like little horses in my body, ready to go, okay? Now, I've gotta do something with that. So if there are things that wanna move, what's the best thing for me to do? Move. Move. Right. Go for a walk. Go connect with nature. Look at the dog playing outside, and all of a sudden your whole mindset changes. Right. But it's, okay. Okay, that's one thing. Okay. Now what I can that's do good. is the next thing, I go into deactivation. I get in touch with my breath. One of my favorite tools that I have on my phone that's free, it's called Insight Timer. I-N-S-I-G-H-T Timer. And it's free, it's wonderful. And it's over hundreds of meditations, whether it's stress, whether it's insomnia, whether it's healing, but I can do a five minute, 10 minute, you know, and if I'm like too agitated, if I can't go for a walk, I can just simply stand up and bounce and shake. Yeah, right, okay. Okay, I can move this through me. And I can also just do some really good deep breathing. Count in for a count of four. Breathe out for a count of four. Get in touch with the rhythm of my breath. That would be another way. Okay, and then the next other thing that I could do, instead of going to food, which is usually people's drug of choice or alcohol or drugs, I say, I need something that makes me feel good. And that's a nice hot bath. It's like, it's like a baptismal. I'm able to just go and, we're born in water. Okay, it brings us back to center. Just go take a nice hot bath, you know, and then with some melodic music on. Love yourself, okay? And this is what I tell everyone, is you're only gonna be loved to the extent you love yourself, period. I'm only going to get assistance by my demonstrating to myself I can meet my own needs. Because otherwise people won't know how. They can't read your mind. But if I'm this person that loves myself and has this great sense of self-esteem, and like people even say, God, Liliana, I've never met anybody who loves himself as much as you do. And I said, that's pretty funny, because I, I thought about it and I said, it's really funny, I talk up to myself a lot. Like when I do something good, I say, good girl, but I say it out loud. When I go work out and I'm walking down the stairs at the gym, I say, good girl. You know, if I you know, do something and make a fabulous meal, or I do something I'm really proud of myself, I'll say to my husband, God, I'm so proud of myself. And he's like, oh, I'm so proud of you too. He doesn't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so again, we, we, whatever we're bringing out about who we are, people see us that way. If I tell you I'm an expert, you're gonna believe me. <laughs> and you don't know what my credentials are because I have confidence. So show up how you wanna be seen, okay? It's really important. Um, so th does that help you in, in a Absolutely. little bit? Absolutely, that was Okay, terrific. excellent. Does anybody have any other questions for me at this time? I hope you guys are all good, okay. Um, all right, so another thing that I, that, I, that I find really interesting is bacteria made you, okay? The, you know, single cell, double cell organism. We're more bacteria than we are human DNA and so forth, right? And even when our bodies disintegrated, our bacteria still remain because we go to ashes to ashes. So we never die, okay? But the interesting thing is bacteria has an incredible amount of intelligence and they talk to the outside world and then the outside world tells them what to do. So if your environment isn't good, you got really terrible communication that your bacteria is telling you. 
If I live in a polluted environment, whether it's emotional toxins or I'm eating, you know, factory raised uh, meats or I'm eating a bunch of pesticide, herbicide laden food, the environment is toxic and my bacteria is speaking to it. So, wow, my bacteria has an incredible amount of intelligence and you've got a lot of bacteria in your gut and in your brain. So I want to feed the friendly bacteria in my body and I want to have a good ecosystem in my gut because this is my second brain. So how important is that? Super, super important. Now, um, another thing that's really uh, important to understand is that you might say, well, what could I do? It's my, it, was my, it was my bad fortune to have uh, a family like this and to treat me like this and that. Now, all of you have uh, known people that you've heard of and you may not have known them personally, but you've heard of these people that they were like the phoenix rising from the ashes. They came from a horrible, abuse, alcoholism, drugs, and all this stuff as, as a child, they were, they were subjected to this. But yet they came out to be powerful people that were giving you a message. Tony Robbins, people like that, Oprah Winfrey, they came from worse things than we could possibly imagine, but yet what did they do? They chose to say, because of that, I became this. Not because of that, I'm in a jail cell and I'm all you know depleted, and depressed, and sad because of that. Well, would I would you rather be rising like a phoenix and, and just say, you know what? I was born through them, but it's my choice to be happy. And no one can limit my possibility because I'm born from the essence of purity and goodness, and everything is available to me. I just have to believe it so. I mean, people didn't walk up to Jesus and say, gee, I wonder if he's a fake or not. I wonder if he can heal me or not. They didn't do that. And Jesus didn't walk to, up, to, up to a person and say, God, I hope I can do it this time. <laughs> there wasn't even a question. <clears throat> so if you don't have, if you have unwavering strength and conviction <coughs> that I'm already well, that right now what I have to just do is unveil my potentially limiting belief system about being well, and I also have to begin to recognize that I'm not perfect and I never will be. But what I can do is be more evolved. The one thing that you're gonna take with you when you uncloak your body from this world, the only the one thing, because we're gonna shed this body like a skin, the only thing we're gonna take with us is our consciousness. That's it. So when I really understood that, I thought, wow, do I wanna go back and repeat first grade? <laughs> or do I wanna come back as a prodigy? Because I have taken the time out to learn to, to really to take responsibility the way my life is turning out. I mean, we are born in an age of greatness. You can get on the computer and find out anything you want. We are born in the information age. Our parents weren't. They had no idea if you had an ADD child, how to treat them. You, you were just hyperactive and bad kid that didn't know how to sit quietly. So you were thought, I'm broken. But we have all this access into knowing how to respond because nobody was given a manual on how to be good parents. And you know, you did this and you did that, you know, and it's funny, like my daughter the other day, she said to me, mom, you know, you should have taught me how to speak Spanish. And, you know, it's your fault I don't speak Spanish, you know, because we had a big family reunion and we're all talking Spanish and stuff. And I said, well, honey, you had a choice. I gave you private Spanish lessons for five years and you were, eh, 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 uh, 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 you know? And I said, you had free will. And at, at that, after five years, and then going off to, you know, J. Sarah and having to take a couple of, of, of semesters in, in Spanish, you passed your class, so you didn't know, but you didn't retain anything because you weren't interested. So it's never too late. If you want to know Spanish, Rosetta Stone, I bought you the whole thing about 20 years ago, okay? So it's choice. And then later she texted me, Mom, you know, don't, don't take it offense. I know it was my fault. You're right, you know, because she's recognized, isn't it? But of course, we always want to blame somebody else because it's just easier. It's an easier cop out for us. But when we realize I have choice, how my life turns out, wow, that's a lot of power. I mean, think of the placebo. I was watching a movie last night. It was a silly movie, but it was a man who had 27 personalities. <laughs> and so how different was the chemistry of his body when he changed from one personality to another? So imagine, it's just because he believed it to be so, right? He believed it to have extraordinary strength, so therefore he could climb up walls and he could do all this stuff, but when he wasn't that person, he had no strength. So how, how's that possible? 
So if I would even connect on a placebo mindset of the believability that I can, then the likelihood of you achieving is 100%. It's infallible. Okay. So I thought that was pretty darn powerful. You have the information for me? Hang on. All right. So why don't you come over here? We're going to do a little demonstration. And um, and so um, now this is how simple the e-box works. And again, uh, it's not just for people who are sick. It's for any human being that's alive, that's breathing. Because I don't know anybody that doesn't have some residue of their life and the way they were treated and the way their parents, parents, parents were treated that they, you know, it's filtered onto them. So you don't have to be sick to do this. All you have to do is be willing to clean your emotional house. So when we do this, I tell patients, you don't need to question this. This is not like talk therapy where we go into therapy and we tell them all the things that happened to us and my mom did this and ooh. Because honestly, if you would tell your, your misery story to somebody, and it would be a sad story. When I listen to these stories, I think that my heart breaks, right? So you could say, I could see how they would feel that. I could see how they would think that. I could agree with you. But what benefit is me agreeing? What benefit is it to you if I agree with you? That means I'm sitting in your misery with you and I can't help you. But if I turn around and I say to you, wow, you know, I really feel your pain. But let's let's rewrite that story. What was the positive benefit that you got out of that? What was the pearl of wisdom of your suffering? And then we look at that. We reframe it and say, well, because of that, I became completely different than my mother, and I never spanked my child, and I punished them in different ways that it worked. Because what they did didn't work for me. I learned and changed. But if I didn't change, that means I didn't learn and it will be passed on from one generation to the next. How silly is that? Pretty silly in my opinion. So like I said, we're really lucky to be born in the age of information. And so um, so what we're gonna do right now is just, I mean, you can't see this, I'll turn it around in a second so that you can kind of see what this looks like. But I'm gonna just ask really simple questions. And when I do this, I'm not trying to trick you or anything, I'm just asking, I'm just wanting you to talk. Even if you said your name over and over again, I still pick up the inflections, whether you were telling me a story about this or that or not, okay? So it's your, your, your tissue will hold all of your memory um, in areas of the body, and I will share with you what that is, okay? Um, I'm just putting her information in right now, so we have this on file. <coughs> So I'm gonna have you put this on. So it's as simple as this. You're gonna put that on. You're gonna usually they pay, the patient will keep this on usually the whole time unless they can't hear well and they want to take it off and on. That's fine. But that's how I will be able to pick up somatic patterning. Um, she will only put her hand here when she actually receives the treatment in a biofeedback manner. What the machine will do, it will tell me what the stressors that I'm picking up in her voice. I'll share it with her and then I will turn around and I will send a frequency just like an acupuncture needle would be in an area of stagnation. And then I'll ask her again to talk, and then we'll see how we resolve it. So each, each time that she speaks, I will get a representation that's called a perception index of her emotional stagnation. And then so we, I like to do you know, five to 10 <coughs> depending on the time we have. And so um, uh, again, there's no right or wrong way. So this is not intellectual, so it's not, it's not you don't think. You let your body do the walking through the yellow pages, okay? All right, so I'm gonna start out really simply just by asking you to state something super simple. Like, um, you know, my name is uh, Danita, I was born here, I'm one of four children, I'm the fourth child, and my mother was a stay-at-home mom, my dad was a salesperson. All I'm doing is getting a little bit of background, okay? Nothing, you know, too uh, invasive or anything like that, and I can continue on that same pattern. So um, when you're ready to start out with your name, my name is Danita, what we don't wanna do is go, um, 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 because it'll be like flat line. There won't be any emotion to that. But I want to just, even if it's just her name over. Okay, so when you're ready. No, I'll, I'll tell you when to put your hand. Okay, so um, go ahead and begin when you're ready. So again, my name. Okay, go ahead. My name is Danita. Continue, like 40 seconds. So my name is Danita. I was born here. I'm the second child. I'm, my mother is a stay-at-home mom. La, 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 la. Okay, so let me start again. Okay, go ahead. Okay, my name is Danita. I was born in Savannah, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I've been in California for close to 40 years. Um, I was uh, the first child. Um, my mother was 
as a teacher and okay, work got it. as an engineer. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell her what I see, all right? Now, what I'm looking for is things that are we call stagnant energy, which will be the color of red. Yellow means high, but usually, I only try to work on the reds because it usually knocks out the yellows, okay? And so the first thing I see is an issue. That, now, remember, we're talking about any time from the time that she was in her mommy's belly till 12 years old, because between that time, you really um, based who you are on the perception of who, how they saw you. If they saw you as a bright child, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm bright. Or if they said, oh, you know, you're not good at math, you would not even try to be good at math. If they said, oh, you're a good artist, or you're not a good artist, you may never pick up a pen again. If they said you're good at this sport, but not good at sports, she would never try that other sport because what, what they say about me, so I must be. So she's patterning herself her whole life based upon what she was led to believe from the time she was in her mommy's belly till 12 years old. So this is the intelligence that you're working from, that point of view. So when I talk to myself and I say to myself, if this critical voice you're speaking to yourself right now, Liliana, you'd be willing to talk to your five-year-old daughter, then go right on ahead. But if you aren't willing to say what you just said to yourself, you have no right saying that to yourself, right? Critical voice, you're this, you're that, you should have done better. But when, if a child came up to you doing the best they possibly can and you said, oh, you should have done better, oh, well, that child would walk away broken, right? But why do we do it to ourselves? It's crazy because we're grown up and we can take it. No, we can't. So again, if I'm not doing something to build up my spirit, to build up my level of confidence, I'm, I'm eroding my capacity to get well, period, okay? So the first thing that comes up for me is an issue that is more in the brain area, and this is a, what we call a, a, an issue with a conflict of beliefs. That might be in an environment, is do as I say, not as I do. That would be a conflict. They're telling me, don't smoke cigarettes, and I got caught and I got frowned for two, for, for two weeks, and you smoke all the time, okay? That means that their actions are not coinciding with their belief system. Now, all of us have been in a situation where we stepped outside our belief system and didn't feel good. Let's just say, for example, you were with a bunch of kids and they were bullying you to, okay, let's steal something, you gotta do it. Or like in initiations and things like that, what they do, right? And you know you were raised to think that stealing was bad, but you didn't wanna be bullied and you didn't wanna be you know, singled out, so you said, okay, okay. And then you do it and you're just like mortified that you did it and you're in fear all night long because you know that was a terrible thing to do. You were, you were taught that that wasn't the right thing to do, but you did it. So what's that gonna do? It's gonna steal your peace of mind. If I steal my peace of mind, I begin to not have a well-being again. Anything that steals your peace of mind starts your eroding of well-being, period, okay? So the first thing I see is the issue with conflict of beliefs, okay? So what I'm gonna have you do is put your hand there. I'm only gonna just do a quick 30 seconds, so go ahead and do that. Now, the output that I usually do is approximately uh, one minute and 30 seconds, but just for practical purposes, we're gonna do a very short one of 30 seconds because I wanted to see how she patterns here. So again, all you're gonna do is, since, since this emotion lives more in conflict here, then all I want her to do is that she takes a deep breath in, I want her to imagine that she's just uh, feeling what it feels like to be in conflict. Gosh, I don't know what direction to go, uh, uh, uh. And, and it makes us not make good decisions, okay? So again, I just want the feeling. The more, we can, the more we can connect to the feeling, the easier it is for our body to be able to resolve this, okay? So she takes a deep breath in, I want her to just feel a little bit of congestion, almost like I had a head cold, that congestion. And as I exhale, it's like somebody just took that congestion, that hat right off my head, and I, oh, this feels great. So the inhale will be the pressure in your mind, uh, you know, and the exhale will be the releasing and letting it go. So kind of think right out of the top of your head, it's kind of like just little oxygen bubbles. So I can feel the density, and they're out, okay? So let's just do 30 seconds. Go ahead and close your eyes. When the music stops, you can go ahead and open them. Okay, so just start with a cool and cleansing breath and just allow the natural rise of the belly as you inhale. And then as you exhale, just allow your body to sink into the chair. There's no place you need to go, nothing you need to do. Just being present to allow yourself to release.
Now I'm always going to ask, and this is not a trick question, did anything come up for you? Did you feel anything emotionally? Because oftentimes, you know, all of a sudden you start thinking about something, and it might be related to what we're talking about, or it might not. And then they'll always say, always ask. And sometimes the patients will say, no, I just feel really relaxed. I feel just really good. But sometimes they'll say, oh, or they'll cry. Emotion will come up. Did anything come up for you? Yes, but not, not like it did at the time. Okay, okay, all right, and that's okay. Because we're never gonna feel how we did at the time. But what we do is it's got stuck in our tissue, which means that it, 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 we need to resolve it, we need to release it to let it go. Okay, so we're gonna do another one, okay? So this next one, what I want you to do, and um, <coughs> all right, so usually I start getting into a little bit more definitive questions like, um, what was your connectedness now with your mother? Okay, so for example, we could have a wonderful mother, but she didn't know how to be connected. She was a great mom, she cooked for us, she cleaned us, she bathed us, but she didn't really <coughs> love us. And she didn't really tell us she loved us because her mother didn't do that to her. And it's, it feels foreign to her, right? But she demonstrates so many things of love, but that most important thing of tactile thing was not happening. And so again, it's not that she didn't want to because she demonstrated it in other ways, she just didn't know how to. And so, um, so if you don't mind, this is a personal question, just, you know, what do you feel you're connected with, Miss, with your mother? Was she a critical mom? Was she a loving mom? Was she had high expectations that you could never meet? Was she just kind of, what was that connected? I start expectations that I could never meet. Okay, so talk, first start with her name and then just okay. continue. And, and I'll tell you when to stop, okay? okay. Go ahead. My name is Tim. No, no, we'll talk about your mom and the expectations, okay? okay. Go ahead. Um, and she was, she was a good, I looked at her she wasn't uh, touchy-feely, and she wasn't, you know. Uh, she okay, got it. Okay. Okay, so now what we have is a pattern that came tw up twice. So when a pattern comes up more than once, this is not her story. This is a generational pattern. So now I can see she was born with this imprint. Okay, so uh, incongruency of beliefs. So again, um, what we say is that our intention is to be able to untwine us from the past. It's like, for example, um, if, a, if a generation back had caused a lot of pain to a culture of something, then the generations that follow have some sense of trying to redeem themselves culturally. Like you might have, for example, um, a German that was involved in Nazis to later on generations to become compassionate philanthropists you know, they're trying, to, they're trying to heal a wound that they have no idea is still part of their tissue. And so it's a generational pattern that I'm seeing with that, okay? Um, so let's just do one more just to have an idea, okay? And um, we won't do the treatment part uh, because we'll just take time. But um, So I want you to talk a little bit about your dad. So your mother demonstrated her love in many ways, but it wasn't tactile. Um, and tactile is so important, right? I mean, if I, if, I mean, the one thing that we need as a child is to know we're safe and that only happens with the heartbeat of the mother and the connectedness and so again did your mom breastfeed no okay and so this is such a huge um, sacrifice because you're connecting with this child and you, they feel the peak pulse of your heart and they feel confident when you let a child cry you know I mean I know all this tough love kind of stuff but then they say they won't rescue me they don't have my back, right? And children really need to feel like no matter what, you unconditionally will always be there for them. So a child who has, who's, um, who lives on rewards and punishment, that's conditional love. If you do this, you get this. If you don't do that, you don't do that. Okay, if you, don't do th if you do this, you're a bad girl. If you do this, you're a good girl. Wow, that's terrible. Now how about if I just said, you know what? Yeah, you're gonna get punishment for that, but I'm still gonna feed you, and I'm still gonna love you, and I'm still gonna hug you, and I'm still gonna wrap with your hair. And you know, you say, okay, I got in trouble for what I did, but they didn't ostracize me, they didn't, pay, they didn't, they didn't pull their love away from me. Because when you pull a love away from a child, they feel like who's they, who's gonna take care of them? They have no clan. It's the worst punishment you can possibly do to a child. Like when parents go, I just don't want to see you. Get out of my face. I just can't stand looking at right now. That is the worst punishment you could possibly do to a child's spirit. Now, if I say, you know, I'm really upset with you, but you know, right now, 
you know, let's talk about this later because I'm really upset right now, okay? Now, children hate for you to be upset with them. If you hit them, it's better than getting upset with them because it's like, oh, don't, don't feel that about me. Well, it works, right? So, but the most important thing is that parents are not taught to ask their children questions. For example, why did you do that? Why did you pull Annie's hair? Well, she pulled my hair. Did it feel good? No, it hurt. So do you think it hurt Annie? Yes. Is that something that you would want to have happen to you? No. So again, you keep asking them questions, so pretty soon they figure, well, what could you have done differently? Well, I could have came to you and said that she took that from me, and so you could, right? So that they figure it out themselves, and you give them confidence in saying, okay, this was not right action, but what could I do next time? Instead of punishment, right? I mean, they're gonna still get their punishment, but at the same time, what you did is you allowed a child to, to, to actually come up with their own, re, you know, what they could do, what they could have done, and at the same time to understand why they're getting grounded for a week. Or, you know, things like, okay, you broke mommy's vase, well, that was really special to me, and so um, what, how, what do you think we should do? You know, because mommy would like to have a new vase. Well, I don't know. Well, do you think that maybe we could take 25 cents out of your, you know, weekly allowance and then we'll just put it in a jar and then we can buy mommy a new one? Yeah. Okay. So now a child from going feeling terrible and bad to now I can, now I can do something to fix this. If you don't give a child a reason that they can fix it, then they're, they, feel, they feel broken. We still feel that way, right? We want to know what resolution is. What can I do to make things better? I want to assume responsibility. Okay, we'll just stop right there, okay? Please? Okay, great. Questions? So do you see how quickly we came up with something? And so again, we would just go on and on and on. And what happens a lot of times is what's called a releasing pattern. Now a releasing pattern means that the conscious mind, that my thinking mind that responds to life, and my subconscious mind, which is where I, I basically <laughs> register all my experiences and patterns, and the, uh, the subconscious mind gives direction to the conscious mind. Like the conscious mind will say, oh, what did I do when that happened last time? It says, oh, you ran from that dog. Okay, let's go, right? So it holds memories here, but this is what we react to. So when we have a releasing pattern, which again is the most, um, I would say, um, at what I, how I wanna put this, it's the best you can do in EVOX because it's, it's telling me that your body body mind and spirit are willing to let this go now okay now when you don't get a, a, a releasing pattern does it mean that it didn't work no it means there's still other strings to this and we will discover them as we move forward so usually with the evox i like patients to do what's called a transgenerational patterning that means they do themselves like we, we started to do then we do mother that means i have you talk about your mother in regards to what she told you about her mother what she told you about her father and what's really sad to me is when my patients say, you know, I don't know anything about my parents' childhood and they never talked story to us. Well, then how do you know who you are? Who's your tribe? So I tell patients who still have a mother and father, interview them, ask them what it was like when they were growing up and how was their mother to them and what they're able to have you know, confide in her, and was the dad just a disciplinary? Who were these people that made you who you are? Because I would guarantee your, your children's children's children need to know that too. That's how we pass on information, generations from generation, and all of a sudden we stop talking story. I mean, I was raised on storytelling. Every Sunday, my mother would invite her sister over who also had 12 children, and we had 11 children, we had a tribe. Okay, we'd all have lunch together and sit around the story and my mother would tell st true stories about their childhood and about all the crazy things that happened that we were just like, oh, and, and, and we continue to do that. We just had a huge family reunion and all the kids are like waiting for the stories because we have my oldest sister who's 80 and my youngest sister is 52. So wow, we got a whole different points of view about how my parents were when they were young and dancing and my mother was singing and doing all this stuff. Well, my sister was, 40, you know, 50 something, my mother was 46 when she had her. She doesn't remember my mother doing that kind of stuff. So how, that's such a valuable and rich history. But think about it. When you think to yourself, well, I don't know anything about my mother's mother. Wow, it's important. It's very, very important. Any more questions about this? I have a question. Okay. <clears throat>
If the person you're testing, <coughs> excuse me, has anxiety, yes, and feel generalized anxiety and pretty much walks around life that way, mm -hmm. and feels it in the stomach, mm -hmm. does that influence what shows up on no, the No, it doesn't. And so, for <coughs> example, um, um, remember this is your second brain. So if I have anything going on with anxiety or um, you build all of your neurotransmitters, you're about 80%. Mm -hmm. And so when we have anxiety issues, that means an extreme overload is on your, on your nervous system. My sympathetic nervous system, how I respond to the world is overloaded. And so again, we need to retreat. I need to retreat and try, I need to recover. At the same time, not only do I need to take away the offense, but I need to rehabilitate, which means the adrenal glands, right? Because the kidneys will be affected by the adrenals as well. And then the adrenals can move us very quickly into fear, which is the future. So we always have to say, if I feel anxious, that means because I'm in the future of the unknown. When I feel sadness, it means because I'm in yesterday. So the future is unknown. Yesterday will never happen again. But if I live here and live here, guess what? I'm living in illusion. And psychotic people do that. It's just a delusion. So I wanna say, get out of the future. Be here now. And how many books have they written about be here now? But you know what's really interesting? It's hard to be mindful. <clears throat> you know, I, I was thinking about that myself and I thought to myself, here I am in the most incredible place in Ecuador, you know, looking at this incredible landscape and I'm thinking about this. What the heck? How did my brain go there? And I kept saying, force yourself into mindfulness, being present, looking at that incredible thing you're looking at right now and being present with it, eating and being present with my food having a conversation and having eye contact with you and not being on the cell phone and trying to you know, do two things at one time. That's mindfulness. If I'm engaged in mindfulness, then I'm not engaged in anxiousness. So again, anxiety is a very real thing, but it's overload, it's an overload symptom. All disease is overload. It's somebody had an overload which blew your circuitry. And again, if I tried to put a 200 into a 100 watt socket, what's gonna happen? Right? What do we have to do? We have to go and reboot the circuitry, which means take the load off first. Mm. Right? So what's cool about this machine, it'll tell me, are you overloaded? Do you have, uh, you know, uh, you know, one thing with belief systems. Now, do you have issues with, um, like each one of these zones is going to represent something. Like, so for example, self-validation or repetitive thinking or sadness or emotional disconnect or self-critical voice or conditional love or anger or fearful or suppressed emotion or unworthiness or rigid belief system. It has all aspects of the human psyche. So it will tell me what's going on. And then again, it's an opportunity to do some clearing and have a better understanding on how I can show up for this again so that it doesn't affect my immune system so that I don't engage and get trapped into this emotion that steals my sense of peace. Look at how many things in a day steal your peace from you. But in fact, nobody can steal anything from you. You give it. Yeah. You give it. So it's really pretty phenomenal. Okay, questions at all? I think we're about so, right at an hour. Yeah, so um, you offer that here. We offer it here. And um, it's like how many sessions or? so so it's what I like you can do one session to try it out I always tell patients yeah see how you intuitively feel yeah. with this okay right. um, and so well, uh, one session is 130 okay that's an hour long um, and then if you what I like people to do is what we call a series and that's five sessions mom uh, yourself mom dad husband and then topic specific the topic specific might be why did I get cancer what was the underlying emotion that allowed my immune system to fall victim to this? Yeah. So it gives us really good information that we can utilize today, not tomorrow, right? And then we give you actually a $150 discount when you do all five sessions. So we try to make it as affordable as possible. Like I said, you don't have to be sick to do this. You just have to want to oh. keep the being of the mind well, <laughs> and we all need it. There's not any human being that I don't test that has got something. Oh, true. Yeah. yeah. So if there are any more questions before we go ahead and close out tonight? There's one question it says, what about children that have cancer? They are not old enough to develop cancer like adults. Why do they get it if it's all emotional? Okay, so um, 
now think about it this way. Um, a child is exposed by DNA in and of itself, okay? So we, what we wanna do is not put blame or guilt on anything. What we have to do is this is a spiritual lesson. What is a spiritual lesson? Because it's not, when the child gets sick, it's not just the child, it's everyone who loves that child will have an impact of this emotion. Because it's very stressful as a mother, you feel helpless because you can't fix it oftentimes, right? So what you wanna say is somehow there was an overload principle, whether it was in vitro, whether there was heavy metal exposure, whether there was, now I don't wanna blame anyone, I don't even wanna blame myself, because how did I know, right? So we wanted to say that this is a spiritual experience and I have to look at the pearl of wisdom from this so that healing can take place. There has to be an overload principle. Well, whether there was too much toxins, maybe there was too much EMF. I mean, women are getting, uh, children are getting cancer because mothers are keeping their laptop on their belly and doing the texting or doing, um, you know, their computer work on their belly. EMF is a real, real pollution. And it is probably what we're looking at is, the, you know, getting to be on the top list of causal effect of a disrupted uh, body and immune system. So, so when it comes to a child, and when it comes to whether it's a child or someone 80 or someone 30 or 16, there's no rhyme or reason and there's no fault to it. It's just what is the lesson that needs to be learned here so that we can get through this and get over this and move out of that. I don't wanna be victimized that, victimized by it, but what I want to do is just say, where do I go from here? And then again, just remember that child is exposed to emotional somatic patterning from generations past. How was it when you were in, she was in your belly? Was there argument? Was there resentment? Was there a good relationship with you and your husband? But we don't want to take fault. Fault, guilt has no place in your home. Shame has no place in your home. What you wanted to say is we're all here on a spiritual journey and how do I move through this so that I can go beyond it? Any other questions? What is the effectiveness of EVOX? Um, well, my okay, I can only tell you by my experience, not only myself, but with my patients. And every patient that I've ever treated has gotten tremendous benefit. Now, they might have even been skeptical the first couple of times and they admitted to me later on, you know, I was really skeptical about this. How could this possibly work, this energy? But then what I realized at the third session, everything started becoming really clear to me. And all these things that I had put back into my memory that I just compartmentalized because it was too painful, all of a sudden I started remembering and I started realizing this made a lot of sense. So usually after about a five session uh, series, patients will tell me, I don't feel depressed, I don't feel depressed anymore. To be able to take full responsibility of yourself is the greatest gift that you can give yourself. And so information is powerful. So I would say that everybody who does Evox benefits. Perfect, okay. Any other questions for me, you guys? So I'm just yeah. wondering, because you spoke, that came on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And in Jesus' message, he always said, he said something about Jesus, mm -hmm. but he always says, we have to forgive. And forgiveness, you know, goes all the way back to whenever, far. I mean, it's like our body is a computer, if you think about it. We don't have to have outside type of computers and all this kind of stuff that's affecting and in, in giving people cancer, it's like you just said, because we're designed so beautifully and wonderfully. And I, I don't know if it's really a question, but I was just saying you spoke nothing about forgiveness, but in, in God's and Christ's messages about you know, God within us. And He is, the Holy Spirit is part of our whole connection with God within while we're in our bodies. So I was just wondering, why did you think we have to have a machine when we're designed, if only we could find the truth that we can just learn to forgive and bless, because he says that it's in giving that we receive. But sometimes when you're holding on to all that old stuff, and if you're not going into forgiveness, Forgiveness is like sheets of things coming off of you. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you find start to find the peace. You can, you can release a little bit to let go, because it's true. People have all these things stored in their gut, like you said, the third mind. Mm -hmm. But he wants to heal us, and gently like a healing balm, 
They call him the bomb of Gilead. He comes and he wants to start re removing those kinds of hurts and pain gently because he loves us. And it's like, it's all like within us, but he says we become transformed through the renewing of our mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's in it, essence the it, whole thing about yeah. Christ. It's not a religion, it's not whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just the power of Christ within us. Yeah, so I would I, agree with I you 100%. Didn't why you didn't talk about forgiveness. Okay, so um, <coughs> did you guys also know what she said? So, okay, so in order for us to have forgiveness, we have to have compassion. Okay, and compassion is where it starts because I can intellectually forgive you, but my body may not. Okay, and so real true forgiveness is a level of compassion. I just say, wow, you know, they hurt me, but I know that they were born out of goodness. I know that maybe the environment that they were in led them to act upon these things. It wasn't a right action, but I have compassion because they are my brother. They are my mother. They are my sister because we're all one. So in order to have radical forgiveness, you have to start with compassion. And it, it, and again, uh, forgiveness mm -hmm. is the key to your wellness because if I cannot forgive myself for even getting sick, right? And I, if, I, if, I, if I can't um, untie you from me by forgiving you, I'll just drag you the whole rest of my life I call it like a little dead chicken around my neck, okay? After a while, it's gonna be sticky. So forgiveness is essential, but without compassion, you will never have forgiveness. So That's I agree with that. That's where compassion comes from, though. Absolutely. As we forgive, we gain compassion. Yes. Because we start releasing the anger and all the byproducts of the normal emotions that people have when they're stressed from all the hurts and pains. No, I would agree with that 100%. <coughs> But again, what you want to say is we can intellectually forgive, but we might not, our body might not forgive. And that's somatic patterning, and I've seen it a lot. And so what we want to do is that we want to come from a place of love, no matter what. I come from a place of love, you know, I mean, as far as like when I'm trying to deal with things, but I have to come from a place of compassion. I have to put myself in their position. And I say, well, okay, I can see that. So yes, forgiveness is huge. So I'm gonna say that is very, very important. Right. Okay, any other question? I have a quick question. Um, is only the patients allowed to do this? No, anyone can do this. And just to kind of, uh, just to add to what she said, you don't need a machine to do anything for you. All you need is the willingness to transparently see yourself and take responsibility for your own level of happiness and joy. Right. But we But this is very fast. Right. <laughs> so with twenty years you do in therapy, you do this in five yeah, seconds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And whether we're sensitive enough to be able to Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So any, any other have, questions? Yeah, I would like your name and card. Okay. Or yeah, sure. Absolutely. Okay. That'd be okay. perfect. Okay, so you guys, thank you guys for coming. We're going to do this every Monday, so hopefully you guys get exposed to all kinds of different modalities yeah, and stuff like that. And you guys have a great evening, okay? Thank you.